The Federal Reserve is getting ready to further deregulate the biggest banks in the United States, showing that they didn't even, they, they, they didn't learn anything from the last financial meltdown 10 years ago that they caused, oh, by the way, that they caused, and that there were no regulations, by the way, nobody was looking over their shoulder, and they knew they were stealing from the American public. Uh, you know, our firm handled these cases after the burn down. We saw documents to where uh, you had Goldman Sachs, you had uh, Shearson Lehman, you had Wells Fargo, you had all of them, all of them talking about this is bad, something bad is getting ready to happen to, uh, to people that are holding this paper or holding these, these stocks, and we got to get out of it. So what they did is they got out of it, right, secretly. They got out of it quietly. They got out of it in a way that nobody would know about it. The CEOs sold off huge amounts of the stock that they were holding, and there were no regulators to look over them. And part of the issue was that they, they had leveraged the banks so badly. In other words, there, there weren't any rules saying how much money the bank had to hold on to. In other words, what is the, how much money do you have out, and if things go wrong, how much do you have, how much money are you holding to pay for all those stupid decisions you made? And so now, <laughs> again, you know, Dodd-Frank comes out and says, we need to fix that. Well, they tried to fix it, and now we see the Republicans and the, and the Democrats. Let me point out, this is very much a Democratic, oh, yeah. Democrat issue. So now, what's happening? Well, it's, uh, they're trying to change the rules, and they can do this through the Federal Reserve instead right. of having to get legislation passed by just altering it instead of full-on making new rules. So what they're trying to do is redefine what a small bank is. And to them, a small <laughs> bank is going to be, under the rules they're about to put in place, and yeah, they're gonna put them in place, a small bank is if you have less than $700 billion, yeah. you're a small local community yeah. bank and you don't need to worry about Dodd-Frank or any of that, 700 billion. Now, in other words, if you have $699 billion, okay, <laughs> You may as well be a mom and pop bank. You're at a that mom point. and pop operation, <laughs> according to these folks. You know, this is like a corner bank. If you've got six hundred ninety-nine billion dollars, okay. So what? What's what's happening is, and this is this is, it's all about liquidity. Okay, Dodd Frank. After we saw the thieves, the Wall Street criminals, who, by the way, were never prosecuted by Obama, were never prosecuted by Bush. Uh, you know, never prosecute. Well, at this point, it's too late, really. The right. statutes run on a lot of it. So, um, so, so the, these criminals, the Wall Street Armani suit criminals, steal billions, trillions of dollars. Actually, the economy lost what the numbers anywhere between you hear two trillion to eight trillion dollars. Yeah. Sometimes, th when you see the numbers and somebody explains how the economy, the economy lost that much money, it's pretty compelling. But it was all about liquidity. Right. The banks did not have the liquidity to do the things they were doing, right? It, exactly. It's a lot like a casino where if you go to cash in your, your, your chips at the end of the night and they say, well, we don't have any cash here. You can't do that. There's tighter regulations on a casino saying that if you have these outstanding liabilities out there, meaning a person playing poker, you have to be able to cover what they, what they claim. The banks, they don't even have that. So if you're out there and you're a bank and you are essentially gambling with somebody's mortgage, in many cases with the burn down, they were betting that the mortgages were gonna fail. Right. And they don't have to have the assets, the liquidity to back up any of their other investments. Yeah, well, ex example, one of my law partners, Peter Mouget, uh, you know, he handled a lot of these banking cases after the Wall Street thieves stole that money and he just finished a case down in Puerto Rico. The jury, came, I mean, the ar incredible. It, when an arbitration panel comes back and gives you $19 million, you know something is really upside yeah. down because that's what happened. It was the same deal. Banking, it was a liquidity issue. The bank, the bank understood. We had UBS, you know, UBS. The, here's what they did. They knew they were holding on to a bunch of junk bonds. They knew that the bonds that they were holding were totally worthless, and they built a special sales team that UBS and Santander, another bank, was involved, that they built a special sales team 
that specialized in selling the junk that they knew was junk, but they were telling mom and pop investors that it's great. Matter of fact, we bought it. No, we didn't buy it. They were selling it secretly while they were selling it to mom and pop investors. And the, you know, you had people lose their entire pensions. You had, we, you know, there are cases where people, they had everything in this. They put all their life savings, their retirement savings into this, into these bond, into these scam. And the banks knew exactly what they're doing. It's so specialized. They put a special team of liars and thieves together to sell this paper. And what's really interesting here is, you know, again, the Reser uh, Federal Reserve, which is actually, you know, Steve Mnuchin with the Secretary of the Treasury, he's one of the guys who pioneered the frauds that led to the meltdown. Yeah. Again, no jail time. Kamala Harris was the prosecutor in California, didn't want to touch him. Now he's Treasury Secretary. We're making every single one of the same mistakes that we made as a country before the tw uh, 2007 burn down. The ex I mean, the exact same. We've set it up the same way. Massive deficit, huge tax cut package, mm -hmm. deregulating the big banks. Smoke and mirrors in the economy. And it's gonna lead to the okay. same results. Well, okay, so here, to me, this is the story. You don't, I can't stop the analysis here. Here you had one Fed, one Fed governor, her name was Lael Brainard. She said the obvious. She said, you know what, we've been through this before. The reason for Dodd-Frank is to avoid it again. And all you guys, the rest of the men on the panel, everybody votes for it. Everybody says, well, you know, and interestingly enough, they all come from the industry. And after they leave this position as a Fed governor, they'll go back to the, understand Bernie Madoff, you understand this is, this is his sweet spot. Yeah. This is a Bernie Madoff kind of deal where you have the, the worst of the criminals in the business that are actually in charge of regulating. Uh, and the other part of it, I, I want to know your reaction to it. You mentioned just a second ago, um, you, you know, you talked about the fact that um, we could have done something about the guy at the top of the, the top of the heap. Let's talk about that a little bit. Well, but we didn't. Yeah, right. Uh, Kamala Harris out there in California, you know, the, the, the chief prosecutor. Uh, it's similar to all the other stories we've seen with opioids with Eric Holder. They have all this information. They know that he did wrong. Right. You know, he was engaging in this, you know, Robo signing of the mortgages, making fraudulent uh, uh, claims with these, foreclosing on people illegally, caused major housing damage to the market out there right. in California. Kamala Ma Harris had all the information. Right. The the all of the by the way, there's more to that. All of the the uh, consumer advocacy groups were pushing for Kamala Harris to have the guy prosecuted. Yeah. And she let him go. Why did she let him go? Why, that, that's that's part of the story. You see, the reason she let him go is because that arm of the Democratic Party has become the Wall Street, they're the Wall Street Democrats. Yeah. They're the Cory Bookers, the Kamala Harris, the, unfortunately, even Joe Biden. Oh, you know, yeah. that's part <laughs> of, that is part of the new, it's not new anymore, actually, you know. It's the Bill, mainstream, Bill, basically, Bill Clinton, is what they are now. Yeah, Bill Clinton started all this. You remember Bill Clinton said, well, we can all get along you know, we don't have to always be on the side of the consumers. We can bring Wall Street into our fold. And when that when that happened, the Democratic Party started crashing and burning. It, it, it did. And, and we have too many holdovers. They weren't a part of it back then, but they have that same mentality. Yeah, exactly. And unfortunately, Kamala Harris is one of them. And that's why we've actually tried to see her or not tried to see her. We've seen her try in the last few months, try to take on these more progressive stances you know, saying like, well, Medicare for all, I, I, I do like that she, now. She did it's nothing. A, it's a she, farce. It's a farce. She did nothing at all when she had the opportunity to do time and time again on cases just like this. So now, where are we? Now we have a bank that can declare, you know, we only have $699 billion, so we don't have to fall under Dodd-Frank kind of regulations. And we don't, you can't come look at our liquidity the way that you should. They can come and look every two years or something like that. But I mean, by then it's game over. I mean, if, if, if a bank engages in the kind of conduct that they did in the first burn down, it's game over in two years.